Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled The ADHD Tax, How to Avoid the Late Fees and Other Costs of Forgetfulness and Impulsivity. So what do we mean by the ADHD tax? Well, it could be late fees for bills not paid on time or lost career opportunities due to past job or academic challenges, replacement costs for missing phones or spoiled food, higher interest rates due to credit score problems. The manifestations of the ADHD tax are diverse, but it is universally stressful and linked to ADHD symptoms in some way. In today's webinar, we will learn more about the ADHD tax, the destructive patterns behind it, why change is hard but possible, and the support structures that can help. Leading today's presentation is Rick Webster. Rick is a coach with 11 years experience. He specializes in finance, small business, and ADHD-related complications. He is the founder and CEO of Renify, a behavioral finance education platform dedicated to creating ADHD-friendly resources and support systems. Rick, diagnosed with ADHD as an adult, also works as an ADHD advocate. He currently serves as the regional coordinator for CHAD of Northern California and is on the CHAD Chapter Advisory Board. Rick leads success clinics for Chad, and he leads ADA's Money Matters recurring meetings. He's been a featured financial expert speaker for Will Curb's Hacking Your ADHD podcast, Rick Green's Totally ADHD podcast, Jessica McCabe's channel, How to ADHD, and Eric Tiver's podcast, ADHD Rewired, and the ADHD Support Talk podcast, all the podcasts. Rick has been a national conference speaker for ADA and was recently a presenter in its online ADA-verse. Before I hand over the microphone to Rick, I have just a few housekeeping items. During the live webinar, uh, you can submit questions at any time in the text box under the video player. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen and if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, just look for instructions in an email that you will receive about an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com. Search for podcast 419 to access the slides, replay, certificate of attendance option. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine today. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Click the link on your screen to download now on the App Store or Google Play Store. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. content. So without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Rick Webster. Thank you so much, Rick, for joining us today and for leading this discussion on the ADHD tax. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Slight tangent just to start right off with, but Inflow is fantastic. I didn't realize they were one of your sponsors, but they, we, we do talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and they are really good at helping guide people through some of those things. So I'm really pleased about that. So anyway, thank you for the introduction. Um, the ADHD tax, you know, it, it means different things to different people. Um, and so we're gonna talk about what it is and, and what it isn't. Um, how to recognize it and how to see it coming, which I think is really important because with ADHD, we get blindsided by an awful lot of things. Um, and what to do about it, the solutions to those things. Um, we will talk about um, a variety of things that we can do. Um, we're, we're certainly not helpless, we're not victims. We can, we're adults, we can do things. Um, by the way, I have ADHD. I was diagnosed probably about 25 years ago. Two of my four kids have ADHD. 
I have ADHD up and down my family tree. As a lot of you probably have a similar experience, we begin to recognize the ADHD in our family tree after we've been diagnosed. It's, oh, I never noticed that before. I never realized that. So in, in case anyone here has a doubt, it is very possible to be uh, quite successful with ADHD. A lot of people are. It's also very possible, likely in fact, to have rather heartbreaking failures um, all in the same lifetime. Um, so we really need to learn how to manage it. Um, and it is generally the unmanaged ADHD that causes these, these meltdowns that we have. My academic background is in psychology. My practical background is in ADHD for the last 25 years, personal finance, real estate lending, business matters, that sort of thing. Um, I coach self-employed people with ADHD, huge. You think it's a niche, but actually a, a huge percentage of us are self-employed or in business for ourselves. It's just, it's just natural. Um, it's estimated, and I haven't been able to find the, the research Again, I found it once and I lost it, but it's estimated that 20 to 25% of the CEOs in this country have, have ADHD. Um, the majority of those are small companies. Um, I think that um, it really makes it clear that we can be very successful with ADHD um, as long as we manage the negative sides of it. Um, so um, again, I do, I do coach people. My whole company is devoted to helping people with ADHD live, live better lives with a concentration in personal money management. According to Russell Barkley, 61% of us have chronic and severe, significant um, money problems. And so it's, it's, it's really a place where we need to pay some attention. Um, I'm not sure how the system works here with attitude. I love interruptions. So if, if moderators, if you see a question that you think is particularly interesting and germane to what we're talking about, just feed it through to me. Um, I, I would love to have your questions. Give me your ADHD oppositional pushback and argumentative side. If you do that, I'll know you're listening. I'll know you're reaching me because the, the fact is, if we don't have any questions, we're probably not listening, right? If we have questions, we want further, further information about something. That would tell me that people are listening. So I'd rather address some of those things. I'd rather address the things that are life issues for you rather than simply guessing what you'd like to learn about. I'd rather address the pain points um, and actually make a difference rather than simply delivering another academically accurate but ineffectual presentation. Um, there's a lot of things that could be done for a living. I could be retired if I wanted to be, but at this point in my life, it's all about the mission. Um, so that's, that's why I'm here. Um, and for those of you who really do want something structured, linear, and progressive, um, don't worry, I have a prepared text and I will get through the entire thing. Um, it, it's the ADHD world, right? We can, we can we can do and have it all. Being a little bit facetious there, but that is how we feel. And I think in some cases, um, if, if we properly remediate the ADHD, we pretty much can. So I live and breathe this stuff. ADHD money and business, it's my wheelhouse. Don't hesitate to ping me over on my platform, renify.com. We're a small but very personal organization. Um, so I wanna talk, I wanna move over to talking about the problem. And I just wanna talk about the problems enough to understand them. And then we want to move into solutions. Um, I think it's, it's crucial. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back one slide here. Um, there we go. Um, the, the thing is, if we think, this is going to sound counterintuitive, um, but if we think about our problems to excess, um, we will have more problems. It doesn't make sense on the surface, but what we think about grows. That's the ironic thing about thinking about problems. I'm sure you've heard that. What we think about grows. If, if, if you think about your problems excessively, ruminate on them, they will not get resolved. As a matter of fact, you'll end up with more problems. Um, so we don't want to be always thinking about the problems. We want to think about the problem enough to understand what it is. And then we want to switch over to thinking about solutions. What we think about grows. If we think about the problems too much, we get more problems. If we think about the solutions, we get more solutions. So it makes perfect sense. It's counterintuitive at first to think about it. The, the ultimate counterproductive um, rumination uh, about problems is worry. Um, worry never resolved a problem. It has never resolved a problem. It, is, it has wasted copious amounts of rational horsepower and emotional bandwidth that could have been employed to working on solutions. So I put that slide up. Do you see the guy jumping across the chasm? Um, do you think he's thinking about the chasm 
or is he thinking about the other side? Which way is he looking? Is he looking down or is he looking over? Um, so thinking about the drop makes it less likely that he would make it. If he was obsessed and he was concerned and he was frightened about the drop, he'd be far more likely not to make it to the other side. But I pretty well guarantee you that guy, you can see the way he's looking, his entire focus is on getting to the other side, um, which means he's focused on the, on the solution. His chances are much higher of getting there. We need to become like that. Um, so we need to think about the problem enough to understand it. He has to know how far it is, you know, what his capabilities are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But once he's got that, he needs to figure out exactly how he's gonna solve this problem. So just make it a mantra until it's etched into your mind what we think about growth. If there's things in your life that you don't want in your life, don't ruminate on them. Think about the solutions, how you're gonna deal with that. Um, so you probably didn't come here to find out what the ADHD tax is. I'm sure you already have an idea. You probably came here to learn what to do about it. And we are absolutely going to be talking about that. And the first thing I want to do here, um, it really is solution-based. It may not seem like it immediately, um, but like I say, I have a psychology background. This is, this is a huge, positive, healthy step to take. Um, so keeping in mind that this forum is not entirely private, it's on the internet, right? I encourage you to share your thoughts. Just leave out identifying details because I'm gonna ask a series of questions here that I'd like to hear the answers to in the chat. Um, and, and as you will see, if you participate, this will be a valuable and cathartic exercise uh, in, in one of the first steps in remediating the ADHD tax. So I'm gonna give a short series of starter questions. Um, and part of it is to, to give my, my Attitude Magazine moderator here a chance to, to pass some of those questions on to me later in the Q&A, so those can certainly go in there. Um, but the second reason, much more important, is because it's how we process. We verbalize pain points in a safe environment. We obtain a witness to our life. It's in chat, it's seen. Uh, we post truth, and whether we realize it or not, we've taken the first step to healing. It's a much bigger step than we might realize. It's the first step in a solution-based process. Um, we all need a witness to our lives. It's a very real, primal need. And if emotional needs aren't met, consequences arise, anxiety, depressive issues, you know, the list is long. So right now we're gonna take that first step. Just verbalize it in just a few words. You don't need to write a paragraph, just a few words. I'm gonna ask some, some thought starter questions here. So what is it, um, and let me check the time here, we're good. Um, so what is it that led you to this program about the ADHD tax? Did some probably pain point brought you here? Might've been yours, might've been some person you love that you were trying to figure out to, some, how to help. So without even defining it, I know you're here because there are pain points, right? So it's okay and you're okay and we just need to verbalize it. Um, how has this um, ADHD tax manifested in your life? on a one to five scale, and you don't need to answer all these questions, just answer the ones that, that resonate with you. On a one to five scale, five being the most painful, um, how much pain has the ADHD tax brought into your life and, and into your loved one's lives? Because we're a, we're a cascade, right? We, 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 we live in a matrix. Everything that we do impacts all the people around us and, and vice versa. So on one to five scale, well, how much pain has it brought to you? Um, do you feel guilt over the things you've done or the things you've not done? Um, do you blame yourself? Do you blame others? Um, again, you don't need to answer all these, just the ones that resonate. Are you angry, frustrated, helpless? Um, do you feel like giving up? Maybe you already have given up. Uh, maybe you've given up and restarted and given up again. Um, do you feel shame, uh, some, some kind of internalized shame as if you have a character flaw, which you don't, by the way? Um, do you do you suffer in silence or, or in secret? Um, name your biggest fear of the ADHD tax and how it applies to your future. What is your biggest fear of a, of a negative outcome? You give voice to these things and it really truly is the first step to a brighter future. You give voice to them in a forum that is witnessed by other people. It doesn't even matter if, if it doesn't matter if they read it, it doesn't matter if you even know them. The point is, you feel and do have a witness to your life, very important. So I was gonna 
scroll down here on my notes and pull up some questions that were given to me before this talk, uh, but I'm already a little behind schedule. So I think I'm going to let that go and we'll deal with it in the Q&A. So what exactly is this ADHD tax? Now, let me run this thing here a little bit and get us on screen. So, so what is it? Um, first of all, it, it it's not just about money, as we all pretty much know if we've lived through it, um, as we'll explore that. But Russell Barkley in 2008 um, researched and wrote that 61% of us with ADHD years, uh, we have um, serious and recurring money problems. But we also have troubles getting through school. Uh, someone who came to me previous to, to having come to me, she had she was getting her master's degree and she's a perfectionist and she was done with whatever this project was her final paper you know weeks before it was due but she's was a perfectionist she wordsmithed it and wordsmithed it and, word, and she waited to the last minute the last 15 minutes and then she said okay i gotta submit this thing she got online at quarter to midnight and found out her internet was down she didn't know because she wasn't on the internet no time no time to run down to starbucks or something there was no time to figure out how to um get it submitted that was an ADHD tax. It, she had to pay another quarter's tuition. She didn't. She got the job, but she had to. She couldn't take the job until after she got the master's degree because it was a job requirement. Um, a huge part of the ADHD tax. This idea that we have a hard time getting started, and then we do things at the last minute. Sometimes it works out. Other times, something more important crops up, and we just can't do that thing at the last minute. So it's a huge problem for us. Um, so another part of this tax is kind of front loaded. And that is that as ADHDers, we only earn 75% of what our similarly talented counterparts earn. Um, it doesn't have to be that way at all. Um, myself, we, we all have our own little horror stories, I suppose. Um, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, I had $800 worth of three speeding tickets that turned into over $11,000 and a not so fun invitation to the courthouse. I mean, you delay these things for four to six years or something. Pretty soon they send you a letter saying, hey, if you don't come in, we're going to come get you. We're going to issue a warrant for your arrest. And, you know, I said, whoa, I guess I better better deal with this. That's my That was my last minute. Well, it was resolved. I had to wait a couple hours in the courthouse, but it was resolved in three or four minutes in front of the judge. He, he identified me. I agreed to, that I owed the money. He said, can you pay it today? And I said, no. And he said, well, can you pay $100 a month? And I said, well, yeah, I can certainly do that. He stamped his paper, sent me to the clerk, and that was that. Um, in three or four minutes, this problem, which had haunted me for, for many years um, and went from 800 to over 11,000, was resolved in three or four minutes. I could have resolved it much earlier. I, I could have gone into court much earlier and said, hey, I can't pay the 800 bucks. Can, what can we do? But I didn't. It's an ADHD tax. Not just the money, but the stress and the shame and the hiding and all that that goes into it. Um, we also have difficulties interviewing for jobs, applying for those jobs in the first place, difficulties advancing advancing in our career. In the interview process, and I talked to a lot of people with this issue, um, we have trouble listening. You know, we, sometimes we just have to sit on our hands because we want to do all the talking and it's not what you should do in an interview. So we have trouble listening, answering the questions that are actually asked, uh, misinterpreting, getting emotionally triggered. Um, being very sensitive to things, oversensitive in a way. And by oversensitive, I think we should be as sensitive as we can be. I think that's a really important human trait. But oversensitive is when we're overreacting to something that was never really intended, that the person didn't mean to insult you, but we feel triggered somehow. That's, that's oversensitive. Um, so as a result, this ADHD tax is pretty much an ugly reality for a lot of ADHD adults, um, perhaps all, um, but it can be remediated. It's a problem, especially when we don't have proper um, support structures in place. And when our awareness, which is what this talk is gonna be, is weak, um, we, need to, we need to become aware of these things. So getting into what some of these issues are, one of the biggest ones is now versus not now thinking. Um, I thought my screen didn't come up right. There we go. Um, we have now versus not now thinking if, if it's, it's either now or it's not now, and if it's not now, it's pretty much irrelevant. I've got a lot of you know fires going on right here. I've got to put those out. I don't have time to deal with that other stuff. I didn't have time to deal with my $800 worth of feeding tickets. I didn't have time. I had other things to do. 
you know, probably taking one of my kids to soccer practice or something, right? But there are other things in my mind that I would prefer to do, and I convinced myself they were a higher priority. So we have to get away from that. Um, it, it's one of the many glitches <laughs> in our thinking process, and it's a huge part of this ADHD uh, tax problem. We seriously downgrade the impact of future consequences, uh, of our current actions on those future consequences in favor of current gratification. We don't prioritize very well, uh, and we need to pay attention to that. We actually should, as human beings, we should discount the future to some degree, Right, you you might get you might get hit by a bus when you're 55. You might be altogether dead when you're 55. So you don't necessarily want to lay everything on the line for your future, but we certainly the future is more likely to come than not, and we want to be prepared for it. Um, so we we discounted a little bit in favor of the present, but for the most part, we want to make sure that we are preparing. So many people with ADHD, it's it's, it's kind of tragic, but they. And not just with ADHD, in the money world, they, they wake up at age 45 or 50 thinking, oh, my gosh, I haven't saved a dime for retirement. I'd like to retire when I'm 65 or 70, but, you know, I'm, I'm barely breaking even here. I have no idea how I'm going to save whatever, a million dollars to retire on. They just, it's not going to happen. Um, and by the way, any problem you have, the sooner you interrupt that problem in the cascade, the less severe the corrections have to be. If you start saving when you're 18, you can save a lot less money per month than if you start saving when you're 60 for, for your retirement. The corrections, if you wait too long, have to be very extreme and severe. So how do we deal with it? Um, one of the things we can certainly do is to get in touch with our future self. This is a mental exercise, but get in touch with your future self um, and say, what would my future self think of this decision or non-decision, which is also a decision, that I'm making today? What opportunities will I not have available to me? Or if I do this thing or avoid this thing, whatever it is, if I, if I do something that is actually good for my future, what opportunities will show up and be available to me if I do this thing now? Um, if we can get in touch with that future self, it can really help us. Um, Simple example, you know, you're down at the car dealership and they've got this really fancy, expensive, you know, I don't know, Range Rover car, and I don't even know what they cost, but let's call it a $120,000 car. And it's really nice. And the salesman says, hey, you, you know, I know you only have $10,000, but we'll finance the rest. Sure, $1,200 a month, 10-year loan or something like that. And you say, oh, man, this is going to be really nice. I can drive this home. My neighbors will be impressed. And by the way, your neighbors will not be impressed. You drive a fancy car, the first thing they're going to think about is, how can you afford that? You know, it's, it's a foolish decision. So what we think our neighbors think of our fancy car is probably not what they're actually thinking. Um, so we drive this car at home. Three years from now, it's a it's plummeting in value because it's a status symbol and it's getting older. So they plummet in value. So this hundred and twenty thousand dollar car that you owe one hundred and ten on is now worth seventy, and you had a really long term loan. So now your loan has only been paid down from one hundred and ten to say a hundred. Now you've got a $100,000 loan on a $7,000 car. You can't even, you have to write a check to get rid of that car. So your future self, if it would be saying to you, screaming at you, really, don't do that. That's not a very good idea unless we really have the money. And if if we really had the money, we probably wouldn't be putting $10,000 down. We'd probably be cashing it out. Um, so your future self can really help you with this now versus not now thinking. You'd say, you know, if I do this, What's my life going to be like in three years? Um, really, it really works. It sounds a little, little hokey, but our imaginations, actually, I believe one of the strengths with ADHD is our, our imaginations. Um, failing to take steps to remediate these ADHD issues is also a decision, by the way. So we really need to take the steps, and that one technique can, can really help. Um, another thing that helps with this uh, kind of time blindness thing, Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is, I highly recommend that book. Um, planning with the end in mind. So part of that is planning in reverse. I have an appointment at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I have to be there at 10. I have to get parked by 9.50. I have to leave the house by 9.30. I better start breakfast and have a shower by nine. That means I wanna wake up by 8.30. If I want a full night's sleep, I need to be asleep by 12.30. If I want that, I need to start my sleep hygiene routine at 10.30. So now 
I know I need to start my sleep hygiene at 1030 to get there by 10. If we don't think all that stuff through, oh, I just have to be there by 10, no problem. I'll get up at 920 and have a quick bite and I'll be on, on my way. Well, it may work, but it, it's, it's an adrenaline rush and it's probably not always gonna work for you at all. Um, and pre-COVID, I'm not so good at this now, but pre-COVID, my mantra to myself was five minutes early is on time. I didn't want to be walking into a meeting, climbing over people, interrupting the speaker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to be five minutes early. And that also helped me once in a while when there was extra traffic or anything else got in the way. Maybe I went out the door quickly and forgot something, had to make a quick trip back. So I had a five minute cushion to do that, which is really good. We need cushion on all these different things that we do. Um, so another aspect of this ADHD tax, I don't think I'm keeping up with these slides too well. <laughs> no, yeah, I guess I am. Okay, is money stress. Um, so it is a huge aspect. It's not just the fact that we don't have the money. It's the stress involved with not having the money. It's chronic and seemingly inescapable. And by the way, chronic and inescapable is a recipe for trauma. Um, uh, just think to yourself, a lot of you, uh, myself included, we have trauma around money. We have triggers where something happens and we say, oh my God, a whole cascade of thoughts show up. That, that's an that's a indication of a, of a trauma. Um, so 61% of us, as I said, according to Barclay, have significant and chronic stress. Significant and chronic financial stress actually reduces physical life expectancy by 12 years. Barclay talks, I think, about 15 to 18 with ADHD. Two thirds of that roughly is chronic financial stress, which 61% of us have. Um, obviously that stress diminishes life satisfaction, really hard to be emotionally available for your kids and significant others, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's all of that adds into this. Um, it makes it worth, the reason I'm saying this is it's worth dealing with. Um, missed career opportunities, I'm gonna move through some of these slides a little quicker now. Um, but we miss opportunities, in not, not just the career situation, but a, a woman I was talking to just yesterday missed a deadline on a, on a home buying opportunity. A brilliant, successful woman missed what was probably a very simple application submission. That is the ADHD tax. It could have easily been done, um, but was missed. Um, so we miss opportunities. Like sometimes we have reasons in our mind that sometimes surface reasons, but we forget, we have a fear of rejection. We think we have more time than we do. Um, so there, there's all of that happening in there. And then of course, you know, hard time getting a job is also we lose jobs. One of the reasons that we earn 75% of our, what our similarly talented counterparts earn is because we're always bouncing on the bottom, right? We're always taking the entry level job, having a hard time climbing the, the corporate ladder, so to speak, or or the business ladder if you're in business for yourself or, or anything. We have a hard time with the long-term uh, follow through of various different things. Um, uh, I'm sure most of us have seen others of lesser ability promoted around us and ahead of us, et cetera. Um, and you know, that causes its own issues and such. Um, so I'm gonna push through a little bit faster here. I obviously didn't, impaired self-esteem, I think it's a big one. Um, I, I think it was incorporated in some of the other things, but when all these different things happen, it's almost inevitable that we're gonna start feeling badly about ourselves. Um, I think that's a problem. Compromised relationships, same kind of thing. Um, it, it's really hard to um, be emotionally available and to not be cranky and, and flip out and all these different aspects that relationships have. Um, it's a little bit out of order, but when I wanted to start my uh, a really small coaching practice, really kind of an experimental thing to see what it was like. The first thing I thought of, and I, I teach this in the business class, I don't wanna do a lot of marketing. I don't wanna spend a lot of money on marketing. So my thought was, where are my prospective clients the moment they realize they need me, right? I don't need to plaster the world with my advertising. I was only looking for eight people. I said, well, where are they? And it occurred to me, they were probably sitting in a marriage and family therapist's office um, with problems with, with money because you know relationship problems are frequently are foundationed by money problems sometimes. Well, I didn't realize how right that was. That was an incredibly deep well. I had my eight people in a matter of days from the time I met the um, marriage family therapist. Um, so it's a huge problem in, in the credit world. I mean, in the, in the work world and relationship world. I have lost my place here. 
credit profile damage. Let's do that. Um, so this is a really big one, and it, it's right up my alley. This is what I talk to people at Renify about a lot. Um, so we get rejected for car loans and home loans, or, or we pay a higher rate of interest, or, or you know, we just don't get the terms that, that an a, a paper borrower would have gotten. Um, it takes moments to trash our credit uh, profile, moments, right? You know, obviously not seconds and moments, but a very short period of time, and it takes years to recover. It's another place where you're going to want to talk to your future self and say, you know what, I want to buy a house in three years. If I don't figure out a way to make these payments, my credit profile is going to tank and I'm not going to be buying a house in three years. Or if I am, I'm going to get incredibly bad terms on it. Um, so we want to be in touch, again, on the, on, the, on the solution side. Not all of our negative feelings are negative, right? We feel pain for a reason. You know, evolution gave us these things as tools to help us. Discomfort is often our friend. Um, it wakes us up before the real damage is done. Remember that it's it's easier to solve a problem earlier in the cascade, farther upstream. Um, so discomfort is a precursor to you know excruciating pain in some sense. So it wakes us up before the damage is done, um, and and we don't want to leave, for example, a pile of nasty letters from the IRS unopened, right? That's that is discomfort ignored, right? There, it, we are discomfort. We know there's bad news in there, but we don't want to see it. When we ignore that and the letters pile up, it just gets worse. And it's an interesting concept, uh, evolutionary concept, but the rustling in the bushes creates more anxiety than actually knowing what the problem is in the bushes. The, the bushes are rustling. I don't know. Is it a wolf? Is it a saber-toothed tiger? Is it a squirrel? I don't know. I'm going to have a lot of anxiety around that, and I won't know what to do about it because I don't really know what the threat is, if there's even a threat. Um, but I will have a lot of anxiety. Um, I'll have a lot of worry, which, as we talked about, does nothing to solve the problem. But once you know, say, oh, okay, I recognize it's a wolf. Okay, it's not a saber tiger. Wolves don't climb trees. There's a tree over there. I think I'm going to scramble up that tree. Now I have an action that I can take, an effective action. So once you know, solutions appear. Until you know, paralysis happens. So as if you have nasty mail from the IRS or any other uh, collection agent, open it. Right? You will feel better knowing what the problem is, even though it is still a problem, than not knowing. And not only that, it leads to action. Just like when you recognize it's a wolf, now you know what the plan is to get away. Um, when you open it up, it says, hey, you owe $10,000. Here's a phone number. Call us or we're going to make things worse for you. Well, you've opened it up. You've taken a small action. It's very much easier to take the next action of just calling them. And by the way, the IRS is, generally speaking, very good to work with. They, they don't want to tip you over. What they want is you back in the fold as a good taxpayer, and they're, they're very good about it. I don't know what happened in the past, but the current IRS is actually um, quite easy and good to talk with. They, they're, they're charged with collecting government's money, right? They, 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 that's their job, but they don't want to tip you over. The worst thing you can do is hide from them, as it's actually the case with pretty much not all, but almost every uh, bill that you owe, you don't want to hide from it. So let's talk about mail strategy, which is another big one. Um, I have a client with um, literally bags of unopened mail, bags, shopping type, you know, brown bags of, of unopened mail. So that's overwhelming. And a lot of us have that. So you don't need to open all that mail, right? The, the stuff that six months ago is pretty much out of date. You don't need to open it all right now. I wouldn't throw it out and shred it yet, but you don't have to open it all. Just start by opening today's mail, right? Maybe yesterday's mail. If the IRS has sent you 20 nasty letters, all you need to know is probably in the last one they sent you, right? They, they don't, they're not all different chapters of a book, right? They're basically, they're saying, hey, at this point, your debt is $12,000. You don't need to open the one from a year and a half ago when it was only you know $1,200. I wouldn't throw it out until you know you don't need it. But if you've got a lot of mail, just start by opening some of those things. Um, really important. So impaired self-esteem, I think we've beaten that horse. I think we've gotten that one. Um, but damaged self-esteem, it, it, it's interesting to me because it leads to what is kind of commonly thought of as the imposter syndrome. I don't feel good about myself. I'm kind of ashamed. I'm going to put up this facade. I don't want anybody to know, right? I'm barely making my payments, but I'm going to look good. I'm going to keep going out to lunch with my friends and spending 
$150 on lunch because I don't want anybody to know that I have a problem. So I've got this imposter syndrome going on, and that can lead to extreme sensitivity to criticism. Uh, I would consider it kind of a shadow syndrome of, of RSD. It's not RSD, but it can lead to kind of a shadow syndrome of that. Um, shadow syndrome is a term, I, a phrase I borrowed from, from John Rady, I think, Dr. John Rady, the co-author of Driven to Distraction and, and that series. Um, RSD, by the way, is rejection sensitive dysphoria. Um, but you don't have to have that to be highly sensitive to, to um, criticism. You simply have to be living a, a life of an imposter uh, brought about by a damaged self-esteem. Um, it makes it really hard for us to handle rejection. And the insidious thing about ADHD is all the emotional damage and disruption we encounter along the way. So let me scoot forward here. I don't want to run out of time. Uh, I want to get to these better solutions. What do we got here? Compromise. Oh, we just took it out of order. That's all. ADHD, what a surprise. Totally out of order here. Impulsivity. Um, I think that's a huge one. Um, and and it, impulsivity leads us to make decisions that are not very well thought out. I mean, it's, it's almost definitional, um, especially when we have a lot of problems. You know, it's the old, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire thing. I don't like it here, so I'm going to jump into something else without giving it due thought. Um, we are much better off when we have a serious problem to actually slow down. My, my first coach used to tell me, slow down to move faster. I was in this kind of frenetic vibration and really getting nowhere. Um, we slow down, we give it some conscious, rational thought and come up with a plan and figure out how we're gonna work our way out of this whatever problem that we're having. Um, impulsivity is worse when we're uh, in trouble. Um, kind of a big deal. Um, so I wanna get to some solutions really quickly here because I, I used up too much of this time. Um, I want to talk, um, what gets in the way of the solutions? I think that would be this slide There we get caught up. So the imposter syndrome, maintaining a facade. We have this kind of a learned helplessness going on. We've failed and failed and failed, and we're conf confident that we will fail again, that you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. We can have shame and guilt, learned helplessness, hiding, you know, all that. This, this facade of okayness, I'll call it, is one of the worst things that we have, where we just, we don't admit to other people that we have a problem. Um, I'm not saying we should wear our problems on our sleeve, by the way, and that's not saying that, but we, sh we need to stop hiding. Um, so, um, so gets in the way, these are very practical things and behavioral modification uh, comes in here and, and back to Inflow, which is at his, or I'm sorry, um, Adjured Magazine sponsor here. Um, they have some great things on that. So we need to work on our habits. Uh, habits are just simply things we repeat without a lot of thought and they can be good and they can be bad. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're uh, lining up more good ones. Structure is absolutely crucial. Um, it, it just, you can't get anywhere in life really if you don't maintain a good structure and structure and ADHD are, you know, they're not very good partners. So we have to work at that consciously. Disorganization, all part of the same thing. Um, so solutions, my number one solution, and I can already see people rolling their eyes, but the fact is if you, I, I've, I've worked with Chad, um, support clinics for close to 25 years ago, since, since I was diagnosed practically. Um, and I, it's like Groundhog Day. I see some people come in there and every week, every, every time we have a meeting, it's the same thing. They're talking about the problem. They're trying some new alternative solution, you know, the, the latest fad treatment or whatever it is. And, you know, they they bought a book called the, the ADHD diet, and now they're trying that. By the way, if, if, if changing your diet gets rid of your ADHD, you didn't have ADHD, you had a nutritional deficiency. So the book is nonsense at its face. I say that having not read it, but the fact is diet is important, but it's not what causes ADHD. ADHD is a genetic issue. Um, in the brain. So I think the very first thing you should be doing is getting an absolutely full diagnosis. So you're aware of what the problem is. This is again, slow down and move faster. Just because you read a book and took an inventory on the back doesn't mean you know everything about ADHD. I would much rather go see somebody who has a, a medical degree and has seen a couple thousand people like me and says, yeah, looks like ADHD, but you know, kind of looks like you have a little bipolar in there too. And uh, you're clearly depressed. I would want 
to talk to somebody who actually could see the bigger picture, someone outside of my my head, because um, I'm in my own bubble. Um, I, I think it's kind of tragic that so many people read a book and they stop right there. Um, so you get diagnosed, you take the meds, you start doing the work. Um, and one of the big reasons for a diagnosis is all the comorbid comorbidities that go along with it, anxiety, depression, bipolar, all, all kinds of things. Um, next kind of step here, as far as solutions go, um, is awakening, um, I think. Huh. Okay, <laughs> maybe I'm not the only one that got it. I think I've got my talk out of order. So I don't think the slides are too crucial. Um, yep. Okay, there we go. So awakening, I, I think we need to realize, I know shortly after my, I had an extreme meltdown. I mean, we, I lived this roller coaster life and then at one point the, the swings just got too great and everything fell apart. I mean, everything. So, sorry. Anyway, you, we live this stuff and, and I think there's a point where the lights kind of come back on Sorry. So, and we start saying, this is not my life. So we go through these things and then we have to wake up and say, this is not my life. I'm here. I want to be over there. That's my life. I need to make a plan how I'm going to get from here to there. So if it's important to you, um, and if ADHD is are truly, if ADHD is truly causing the difficulties in your life, then take it seriously, right? I'm not saying there aren't some alternative treatments that work, but it's clearly demonstrated that proper diagnosis, mainstream medications, um, behavior modification, and an ADHD-friendly living environment, those are the things that actually work. Um, try all the other things if you want to, but don't forego the things that have been proven to work. Um, so once, you're, once you are diagnosed, um, you know, I'm going to give up on the slides. <laughs> it's just taking too much time. Um, but yeah, be, being authentic is absolutely huge. That's part of that imposter thing. We just got to come out. And it's why we did that exercise in the very beginning. Put your pain points out there. Talk to people about these things. Don't wear it on your sleeve to just everybody. You don't pick somebody in the elevator and start talking to them. But pick friends that you can be, that you can trust. And by the way, if you can't trust your friends with your emotional vulnerability, that's one of the things. My entire social matrix practically changed when I was diagnosed, I, I just realized these people were kind of toxic to me. I needed to find other people that weren't. So doing the work, um, once you're diagnosed with that knowledge, support groups like Ada and Chad are great to go to. You know, personal plug, but Renify has classes in community uh, and we're all about doing the work. We're all about the accountability, the community, the belonging, the knowledge, the optimism or pessimism, pessimism getting out of our own bubble. It, it, that's what we're all about. Taking the medication is just really important. I, I know, you know, I would rather not take medication myself. I'd rather have blood as pure as spring water. But the fact is, it works. It's like glasses. I'd rather not wear glasses, but they work. They make my life better. So I wear them. And the glasses have minimal side effects, right? I could get hit in the face. I could get glass in my eye. It's highly unlikely. Compared to the benefit I get, those side effects are minimal. Same thing with most medication. Um, Behavior modification therapy, really a, a good thing to be doing. Um, and don't underestimate the need to create an ADHD-friendly living environment for yourself. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you blame everybody else for the problem, but it means you begin to structure your life in a way that works for you. More than most other uh, communities and populations, we need to design our own life, right? And we, we, have, we obviously have to fit within the structure of the world, but there's so many different ways to be and we need to design our own life. You don't want someone else, you know, you don't want some idea that you learned in grammar school dictating what you're doing for a living today, for example. So getting in touch with your future self, super important. And then maybe the last thing I wanna to get to because I know I'm out of time, we need to develop systems, routines, and support. Support systems, getting it done systems, balance and boundary systems, Social matrix systems, really important. Choose your friends wisely. We are highly influenced by the closest people to us. So in business, choose successful people to associate with. And in personal life, choose proactive people, positive people to, uh, and I don't mean Pollyannish, but positive people who are reality oriented. Those are the people you want in your personal life. You don't want someone that'll just tell you, oh, hey, it's okay that you were late. 
you want to say, you want someone who says, hey, I noticed you were late the last two times to the meeting. Is there something I can do to help you with that? That's a friend. A friend doesn't say, don't worry about it. A friend helps you deal with it. And then, of course, there's foundational, you know, it's my mantra, one of them anyway, is sleep, diet, and exercise. You need to get those. That's your baseline. You need to get those under control. Um, the problem is ADHD comes with sleep issues as well. Um, so it, it is a, it's all locked into this matrix. But if you don't get proper sleep, if you're slightly sleep deprived, your ADHD symptoms will go off the rails. And ADHD symptoms, by the way, are, are situational, right? They're, they're not always the same. It depends on the situation you're in. If you have ADHD and you're a taxi driver, you might be happy as a clam. On the other hand, if you have that same ADHD, exact same personality and everything, you're struggling through law school, a very different situation. So the ADHD will manifest differently depending on your situation. So I have more here, but I think that I'm over time already. Um, Annie, what do you think? Well, Rick, we do have a number of questions. So I, maybe we'll get to some of that content via these questions. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, uh, first of all, there, there are 1,400 people in this live webinar. We don't usually announce the numbers, but I feel like it's important for people to know that they're not alone. There have been more than 650 questions that have come in or comments that have come in. So please know that what you are experiencing is not just you. It's not a personal default that this is ADHD. This is what it looks like in adults. And I just feel like uh, the, the comments that I'm reading are really heartbreaking. People saying that they have been suffering in silence, that they feel ashamed, they feel stuck, they feel frustrated. And there seems to be, as you've said, just such value in um, support. So mm -hmm. I think that's my first question is, um, are there established support groups for people? Or, you know, if not, what do you think is a good first step for people to take when, you know, the hardest thing is letting go of that shame long enough to ask for help? Absolutely. We are social creatures. By, by evolution, we are social creatures. And so suffering in silence is actually spiraling downwards into a depressive life and spiraling upwards would be getting out of ourselves, thinking about other people, interacting with other people. And there are quite a few organizations, the two that come to mind, well, three if I can't ratify, but the, the two that come to mind first would be ADA. Uh, ADA is, is fantastic. They have, I think, I don't know, 26 to 30 different support groups where people get together and they talk about various different things. You pick the group that you like. Um, ADA is like, I don't think they just raised the price, like 70 bucks a year, right? It's a rounding error on your finances. And it's so valuable to make connection with other people who have these same kind of issues and that are working forward and, and dealing with them. Um, I, I volunteer with them and I do their Money Matters one. And, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's not amazing to me because I know the stats, but there's, it, it is amazing to me that there's so many people that have these kind of issues and they're, they're, they're resolvable. Um, so yeah, that would be the first thing. Ada has them. Chad, I, I also do uh, some support clinics for for Chad, and they're good too. Uh, they're both they're both great. Um, so you can look both of those up. Um, I'm in the Northern California. I'm the regional coordinator for for NorCal. Um, love to see you in one of our meetings if you want. All you got to do is go to our calendar. I think it's chadnorcal.org, um, and look on the calendar there. And you know it's. It's mostly all volunteer run, except for the national uh, office. Um, so it, it's a good community. And I think last I checked, they were like $53 a year or something, again, a rounding error. And you don't even have to join. With ADA, I think you have to join because it's all online and they're, they have the system. But with Chad, it, we just send people a link. <laughs> they just show up, you know, that's how it works. And then, you know, I know it's a plug, but but Renify, that's, that's the whole point of Renify is to establish this community and, and teach people how to work their way through these these negative issues so they can have a better life. Um, but those would be my suggestions, Chad, Ada, and, and Renify. Okay. And just for those uh, who are asking, it is A-D-D-A -A, um, is, is Ada and Chad, C-H-A-D-D. -D. Um, and then, um, Rick, your website, is that, um, 
I should have it here, but of course I've got my own tabs going. Um, R E N A dash F I or no dash. You can take F-I. the dash out. They'll both work, but take the They'll dash work. out. You get them all. Okay. Yeah. It, it's renify.com. And ADA, it is ADDA, but their website, because they got it a long time ago, was ADD.org. So leave off the second day. ADD.org will get you to them, and they're a great org. All three. All good. So we will also, um, the Attitude team here, we will collect these links. And if you are listening either live or on replay, we will include these in the resources so that you have easy access to them. I feel... um, yeah, we will we will make that uh, as simple as possible. Um, okay, so uh, so that was sort of step number one, and then a number of people who are just you know overwhelmed, understandably. You talked about ADHD diagnosis and treatment as steps, you know, one and two, two and three, whatever, right up there, um, getting that squared away. Um, <laughs> any other advice for breaking down what feels like a mountain of to-do lists? You said, you know, opening those pieces of mail that have been kind of weighing heavy on your mind. Any other first steps just to help people get this going in a in a way that's not totally overwhelming? Absolutely. And that really is the point. It is totally overwhelming. And when we get overwhelmed, we shut down into some kind of state of paralysis, and then we get far less done, not more. We get less done. We, we work. In, in my case, I was working 14 hour days, and I was getting almost nothing done. My whole world was falling apart around my ears, and, and nothing was happening. My, my very first, first coach told me, slow down to move faster. And it was, you know, Sounds incredibly simple, but it was the best thing I ever heard. And so we started with some very, very easy stuff. I, I think there were three three items on my list. One of them was to mail off my utility bill. There were three things on my list for the next day. I actually failed to get all three done. I got two done and failed on the third, and I was afraid she was going to fire me. <laughs> very, very early stage stuff. Um, but that's how hard it is. It's very hard to change our behavior. If you think of our... Be, and, and we want to start slow, and then we want to start adding on. We, we start, start layering in. But if you think of the matrix of our life as a whole array of forces acting upon us, we are in equilibrium. At, whether we like it or not, we're in a state of equilibrium based on all the forces acting upon us. And if we want to change, we have to start cutting the ties to the things that are pulling us away from where we want to be, Right, And we want to strengthen the ties that lead us to where we want to be. So strengthening ties in ADHD might be joining an organization like ADA and listening to other people and making friends with people and learning learning about this and and all those things. Um, Cutting ties might be uh, eliminating some of the things you do that are actually damaging to you. Maybe you're eating way too much junk food. Maybe you're not getting any exercise. Picking something, some small thing, and saying, you know, I'm going to make my little dent here. I'm going to start with this thing. And, you know, small moves, small moves stick. If we try to change everything at once, it isn't going to work. We can white knuckle it for a while with self-discipline, but we will be pulled back to that state of equilibrium that we were in before. We've got to change the matrix of the forces acting upon us. Um, would love to go deeper into that, but I don't think we have time. But it's it's absolutely crucial. We are where we are because of the forces acting upon us. To move, we have to change um, those um, those forces. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't need to tell you, a lot of people listening um, know all too well that decision-making is difficult when you have ADHD. So you've got that on top of it. Um, and, you know, worried about it. Uh, basically, the... The, the internal debate about the best place to start means that they don't start, right? Um, <laughs> I, 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 let, me, let, me, let me push back on that just a little bit. I, I agree with you. But decision-making isn't the biggest problem because a lot of times we just impulsively make a decision and, and then we don't follow through in it. The biggest problem, I think, in this area with ADHD is this in tension action gap. We intend, we made a decision, we intended to get the oil changed in the car, but then we didn't take the action because we ended up doing the dishes in the lawn in the garage, whatever it happens to be. Um, so it's 
the decision, yes, we, we should take some time and make good, well thought out, rational decisions, right? Taking our emotional mind into account, but making sure the rational mind is kind of, you know, piloting the ship. Um, but then we have to have systems and routines and plans and ways to activate on those decisions. Decision making is a problem, yes, but activating on those decisions is a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are resources out there, as we as we discussed, for helping get yeah. some organization around that. Um, I did want to touch a bit more on your concept of the ADHD friendly living environment. A number of people asking um, if you could give some examples of what that would include. Is it the diet and exercise and um, uh, treatment that you discussed, or are there other components to what, what comprises an ADHD-friendly living environment? I think there's so many components. It, it, it really depends on the person's individual living situation. But one that comes to mind, it, a big problem in the ADHD community is clutter, right? And it can slip over into hoarding, but I'm talking about just clutter right now. It's interesting to me, but the science shows that clutter and behavioral issues are bi-directional, okay? You might say, hey, I'm depressed, I feel anxious, and you know, I don't feel like cleaning up the, the, the place, I'm just gonna let it get, it, it just got that way. I don't know, a little at a time, it got to be a huge mess. Um, so we think that it was our mental process that created the clutter problem, and, and in a way, we're right. But what we find is if you clean up the clutter problem, that the mental processes begin to clear up too. Um, there's another, maybe a clearer example of this is handwriting. If you're really anxious and things aren't going right, your handwriting probably deteriorated, right? It just makes perfect sense, right? You're, you're nervous, you're handshaking, whatever it is. If you take just a few minutes and carefully write something out in your best handwriting, you will actually find a bi-directional impact. You, your thinking will settle. You'll get more calm. You'll get more clear simply by the act of straightening out that handwriting. So in terms of ADHD friendly living environment, I wouldn't want to be, you know, fighting with my significant other all the time. I would say, okay, let's make some peace here. Let's figure out a plan that works for both of us. I'm not using my ADHD as an excuse, but I have these issues, these problems. So let's find a work away, work around for those. Make sure there's less stress in the household for that reason. You mentioned food. You only have to be strong about food at the grocery store. If you don't bring it home, you're not going to be eating it. So at the store, you know, don't go when you're super hungry and go with a list and shop at the outside aisles. There's lots of little strategies. Just bring good food home. And then you don't have to worry so much about what you're eating. Um, but in the ADHD community, because there's a lot of depressive issues and stuff, people eat to feel better, you know, just like in the shopping world, we do retail therapy. We do these things that are detrimental to ourselves because they make us feel better in the moment, almost like a narcotic shot in the arm. Feels good in the moment, but it compromises our future. Um, so, so yeah, I guess those are some of the things that, like I say, every person's living environment is different, but we want to be where we're not continually stressed where, you know, people around us are, are happy with our behavior and we're doing okay. We're doing what we said we would do, all those kind of things. Okay. That's very helpful. Um, and a, a very quick follow-up because we are short on time, but do you recommend Ren to your um, clients? I'm thinking of, um, uh, do you recommend removing from your phone apps that may, um, encourage impulsive spending. I'm thinking of, you know, shopping apps and also like DoorDash and things that would allow you to have not healthy food delivered to your home. Should we remove those from our phone? Absolutely, absolutely. If it's not helping you, it's harming you. And so there is, a, there is an app, I'm sure there's several of them, but there's an app that keeps track of your screen time. I find that really interesting. When you look on there at the end of the day and it says, hey, you spent four and a half hours on Facebook, that might be a clue. I mean, four and a half hours on Facebook is basically like eating five bags of Doritos. It's not healthy for you, they're, they're, you know, unless it's part of your business. So I would remove the negative attractions, just make it a little bit harder to get to. It doesn't mean you can never go on Facebook, for example, but if you have a problem with that, you may want to remove it and make sure there's at least two or three steps you have to take in order to get to it. So I would absolutely say that. Um, I recommend simplifying, I, I think, this is this is just an age-old 
concept that that holds true it's been true for a thousand years we need to simplify our lives needless complexity harms us and especially with adhd needless complexity just gets in our way so simplify down to the elements that you need and then you'll have much more time and bandwidth for all the things that are actually more important to you right you if you're I don't know, maybe, that, maybe that's enough said, but we need to simplify our lives um, in order to live the best life that we can. That doesn't mean we're doing without, all right? I'm saying simplify, get rid of needless complexity, get rid of wasteful things. Um, you know, I, I like to listen to music, for example, but I don't listen to music all the time when I'm out hiking and when I'm, at, when I'm driving, which is my primary time for listening to music. I, I just kind of said to myself, okay, you know, Roughly, I think I'm going to put 25% of my time into music because it makes me feel good, recharges my batteries. 75% of that time I'm going to put into listening to a book and not a fiction book, a book that actually teaches me something. Um, so I think we can make these conscious decisions. I'm not going to deprive myself of the music because I enjoy it and I think it does have a good use. But I'm also not going to be 100% doing that at the, at the, uh, by compromising my educational future, for example. And I do think it's healthy to be a lifelong learner. It keeps us alert and alive and gives us a meaningful, purposeful life. Well, on the topic of lifelong learning, I think this is a fantastic first step, um, not only on, on that road, but also on the road to taking control of the ADHD tax. So, Rick, thank you so much for leading this discussion, um, engaging this community this has been, um, I think, a very supportive environment and one that has left people feeling much less alone. So thank you so much for that. And, and thank you to the Attitude audience who contributed here today. Um, you've given us a lot of good ideas of how Attitude can further help you. Um, and our team will be working hard to do that. Um, and I do want to mention that our, our next issue of Attitude Magazine has some content that you may very much find helpful about ADHD after 50 um, and why uh, adults tend to quit their treatment programs. So um, check out our fall issue um, and please join us again for another webinar. Next week, we are talking about the power of positive reinforcement, um, of why rewards trump punishments for students with ADHD with Dr. Gail Tripp. We hope you will join us for that. And again, we want to thank Inflow for sponsoring today's webinar. Rick, thank you so much. And everyone, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.